Misinformation has spread the lie that salt is bad for people. Nothing could be further from the truth. Salt is key to life. When most people hear the word salt, they immediately think of sodium chloride or table salt. But sodium is not the only salt forming mineral. Electrolytes such as magnesium, potassium, and calcium also form salts. Deficiencies in the electrolytes can have devastating effects on the human body. Limiting salt in your diet increases the risk of hyponatremia, mineral deficiencies, hypertension, poor neuronal functioning, fat storage, heart attack, and poor sleep. Most of us don't need to eat a low salt diet. In fact, we need more salt in our diets to improve our health. Stop ignoring your salt cravings while you opt for low sodium, tasteless foods and bland meals. Allow your salt cravings to guide you toward a state of perfect health. Your body is speaking to you. It's time to start listening. It's time to think again. Salt. The white wonder. As you know, we've been told to watch our salt intake. How commonplace it seems. And yet, these tiny white grains represent a fundamental necessity of our existence. A new study is shining light on the amount of sodium Americans eat. Number one risk for a diet-related death, sodium. Yep. According to data published by the medical journal The Lancet, eating a lot of sodium increases our risk for chronic diseases. By the turn of the century, the low-salt diet myth has been thoroughly disproven in the medical literature, drawing upon evidence from hundreds of contradictory studies and reviews. However, the myth pervades conventional medical advice and the media attention to this day. Even the U.S. federal and state governments via the FDA and U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, with a seemingly endless stream of high-profile initiatives led by power-hungry politicians and regulators, have been openly advocating for the general public to lower their salt consumption. For example, by 2010, Michael Bloomberg, mayor of New York City, convinced 16 food companies to lower the salt levels in their food manufacturing, and medical associations like the Institute of Medicine were lobbying the FDA for nationwide regulations. But why? Where did this theory even come from? Do we really need to eat less salt to be healthier? And why is the government even involved at all? Like all great conventional wisdoms of the last hundred years, the salt myth finds its roots in the development and distribution of pharmaceutical drugs. It all started with syphilis. From as long ago as the 16th century, mercury had been used throughout Europe for the treatment of syphilis, the sexually transmitted bacterial infection that rose to epidemic levels after Christopher Columbus returned for his second homecoming to Spain in 1497. Mercury is rapidly absorbed in the bodily areas commonly affected by syphilis, the rectum, genitals, and mouth, and was used for hundreds of years to kill the bacteria. As you can imagine, mercury treatments are not exactly safe, leading to a host of other heavy metal toxicity symptoms including sudden death with no warning indicators and rapid onset of severe diseases including nephrotic syndrome or kidney failure. However, use of this treatment spread across Europe and was widely used up until the 1950s when the US pharmaceutical industry made headway with safer alternative drug development and stopped using mercury and arsenic as antibiotics, replacing them with penicillin, which was discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928. One key element to note about mercury treatments was that they were diuretics, officially known as mercurial diuretics. With the development of new diuretic treatments beyond common, historically used organic xanthine diuretics such as caffeine, theobromine, and theophylline, which can be easily extracted from plant sources, drug companies began to notice other applications. The first modern diuretic drug of the 1950s, acetazolamide, a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, proved an exciting entry into the subsequent development of chlorothiazide, furosemide, and ethacrinic acid. Scientists soon realized that these drugs had the ability to be prescribed widely for use in many different clinical applications, including treatments for hypertension, heart failure, many forms of edema, and even obesity. They also began prescribing these diuretic drugs to pregnant women with the purpose of decreasing water retention during pregnancy. At the same time, Walter Kempner, a Duke University scientist who had fled Nazi Germany during World War II, began developing and testing a novel dietary protocol for decreasing blood pressure, with a strict focus on white rice and fruit intake. The lack of salt consumption in his diet protocol quickly led to discussions in the medical literature about salt's role in hypertension, and the popular sentiment quickly led to physicians accompanying their prescriptions of the aforementioned diuretic drugs alongside a recommendation that the patients also eat a low-salt diet for maximum effectiveness of the diuretic effect, since diuretics chiefly act to excrete sodium in the urine. Salt restriction, however, is extremely damaging to the prenatal development of the fetus in the womb, and it became well known by more discerning scientists and physicians that these recommendations, especially to pregnant women, would lead to a widespread damage to millions of newborn children. 
By reducing salt intake during pregnancy, the developing fetus is not receiving adequate oxygen due to the lowered blood volume, since sodium is essential for maintaining blood volume. The low sodium in the body also prevents enough blood from circulating through the kidneys, which causes the kidneys to release more renin, a signaling enzyme, which is a compensation mechanism the body uses to increase blood pressure in order to circulate blood more quickly. This lack of oxygen to the growing fetus and the resulting reduction in CO2 production, not surprisingly, can lead to developmental disorders in the child and postpartum hormonal imbalances in the mother, which commonly symptomize in the forms of hair loss, depression, and skin issues. The opposition to mass prescription of modern diuretics and low-salt diets was mounting. However, diuretic drug sales continued to prove massively profitable for the drug companies, and the low-salt diet myth quickly became the conventional cliché, parroted in the popular media and throughout doctor's offices across the country. The ball was already rolling down the hill, and with so much profit to fuel its acceleration, it became impossible to stop. But is salt really the cause of hypertension and edema? In short, no. This castle was built on a foundation of sand. While it's easy to find an array of studies demonstrating small drops in blood pressure with lowered salt intake, these results do not necessarily indicate any sort of causative role of salt consumption in high blood pressure. The results seen are typically so minimal that it becomes obvious to a scrupulous eye that there's a lot more intricate story here at play. For example, the Department of Health and Human Services funded an 11 trial salt restriction study executed by the Cochrane Collaboration in 2004. This demonstrated an average of just a 1.1 millimeter mercury drop in systolic blood pressure and a 0.6 millimeter drop in diastolic blood pressure with salt restriction in healthy humans. This is basically going from 120 over 80 to 118.9 over 79.4, results that can easily be achieved any number of ways. However, the headlines in popular media outlets chimed out the bells that salt causes high blood pressure, further perpetuating the myth in the public's mind and within the medical community, while continuing to ignore highly contradictory results from other wide-scale population studies, such as the InterSalt study of 1988, a data-driven collection of results from 52 international research centers that demonstrated that the highest salt-consuming individuals who consumed up to 14 grams of salt per day actually had lower blood pressure levels on average than people who consumed half that amount. The results of the 2004 government-funded Cochrane study and ensuing media attention became even more tenuous when you understand that the fact that the Cochrane Collaboration had conducted a study just one year prior in 2003 reviewing 57 salt restriction trials and concluded that there is little evidence for long-term benefit from reducing salt intake. A large study done in 1995 on 3,000 people over four years led by Dr. Michael Alderman and published in the journal Hypertension demonstrated that individuals who ate less salt indeed actually had a higher prevalence of increased mortality rates than those who ate more salt. They also found that by adding more salt to your diet, the subjects had a 36% decrease in heart-related mortality events. Three years later in 1998, the Alderman team published another set of findings on a 22-year-long study they've been conducting with over 11,000 people that showed a clear inverse relationship between salt intake and mortality. In basic biochemistry, it's well understood that the breakdown of ATP to ADP plus phosphate is required for the cell to use glucose and oxygen in order to maintain homeostatic functioning of the body's core metabolic processes. This breakdown to ADP and phosphate cannot happen without the presence of adequate sodium in the fluid around the cell. The more sodium present in this fluid, the better the cell is able to increase its energy consumption, which leads to more CO2 production, fueling your metabolism properly and balancing the effects of intracellular calcium. When unchecked by sodium and the resulting lack of CO2 production, calcium can exert toxic effects on the cell, causing premature cell death. All these compounds must be present in healthy levels in order to ensure the proper functioning and movement of ions through ion channels on the membrane. Put simply, you need sodium, badly. At this point, I think it might be helpful to take a moment and clearly define what salt actually is in order to better enrich your understanding of how important it is to your health. So just think back to high school chemistry class when you learned about ions. Uh, you probably remember an anion and a cation and learning about those, uh, but at least in my experience, they were, they were always coupled with anxiety-inducing equations and even final exams. Cations are ions with a net positive charge. They have more protons, which are positively charged, than electrons, which are negatively charged. Now, anions are simply ions with a net negative overall charge. They have more electrons than protons. Easy, right? I mean, an ion itself is really just an atom or a molecule that carries an electrical charge. Our bodies are like big organic magnets. The principles of electromagnetism apply to us, just like they apply to the U-shaped polar magnets we used to play with as kids to grab metal paper clips off the ground. Every second of every day, millions of imperceptible ionic reactions are taking place inside you. 
They're vitally important to your survival. If they all stopped happening, even just for a second, you would die on the spot. A salt then is quite literally a chemical compound that's created when a cation and an anion are attracted to one another uh, due to opposing charges. And by combining through a chemical process, they actually become a net neutral charge. Let's take table salt, for example, NaCl. The cation sodium carries a net positive one charge. The chloride carries a net negative one charge. Combine them together and boom, you have table salt with a net neutral charge. Since naming conventions indicate that the cation must be first and the anion second, it's common for people to refer to salt simply by using the cation, like sodium. However, it's important to know that there can be many different types of sodium-based salts, and the same is true with other cations such as calcium, magnesium, and potassium. Salt itself is so essential to the human body that saltiness is one of the five classifications of perceptible taste by taste receptors on the tongue. And it's so essential to life in general that it's actually the main mineral constituent of ocean water and a huge part of the Earth's crust, especially underwater where hydrothermal vents in the oceanic crust basalt continually pump minerals into the ocean from the Earth's surface. Restricting your salt intake compromises your body's ability to function properly, especially on the cellular level. Any sort of dysfunction on this micro level can have wide-reaching negative effects on the macro level as your body's natural compensation mechanisms are gonna kick in to overcome the lack of salt that it requires. For example, I mentioned previously that when the kidneys don't have enough blood flow, which is facilitated by sodium, they compensate for that by releasing a signaling enzyme known as renin, which increases blood pressure in an attempt to get more blood to the kidneys. This leads to a full activation of the RAAS, or the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which quickly increases risk of hypertension, kidney problems, heart complications, and rapidly increases serotonin production, another poorly understood insidious health issue I will discuss in more detail later on in this video series. Long story short, salt restriction actually causes the very health issues that the medical community keeps telling you that it solves. This is just one of the many examples highlighting the dangers of parroting conventional wisdom cliches, a multi-generational propagation of misinformation that continues to harm millions of people's lives. When your body has enough salt, you reap the rewards of vibrant health. You move into the thermostate effortlessly. Your body is a self-healing organism, provided with all the raw materials that it needs to operate correctly. So the next time you reach for that extra pinch of salt to make your food taste better, think of it as a daily ritual to help lower inflammation, increase your metabolism, and lower your stress hormones. That extra pinch of salt can also protect your brain against anxiety and depression while improving your brain's ability to learn new things and retain information. When your body is using glucose properly, your metabolic rate increases rapidly and the self-healing properties kick in, which brings your health back into balance. When your body is not using glucose properly, free fatty acids start dumping into the blood as an alternate fuel source, which requires a systemic increase in stress hormones cortisol, estrogen, and adrenaline, which serve to catabolize tissue and slow down your metabolism while compromising the basic functioning of those vital organs. The fatty acid metabolism is also known as the survival state, and uh, what happens is that your blood pressure goes up, your uh, reproductive function starts to decrease, you start to have blood sugar issues uh, in general, your, your, your uh, metabolism decreases, and your vital organ functioning actually starts to decrease as well. And your body's naturally doing this all in the, in the name of actually trying to preserve natural resources. In 2001, a detailed meta-analysis of 6,250 human subjects published in the American Journal of Hypertension found no evidence to conclude that salt restriction helped people lower their risk of high blood pressure, heart attacks, or stroke. A few months prior to those findings, another study published in the Journal of American Medical Association concluded that lower salt intake increases the risk of premature death from heart complications. The interesting thing to note here is that those medical journals are well-known and respected resources in both the U.S. and the international medical communities, and they receive government funding. However, their findings on analysis of the salt restriction myth continue to fall on deaf ears within those same communities because of the deeply entrenched groupthink that has been established for so many decades to this point. In 2006, the Journal of American Medicine published their findings on a massive analysis of the salt consumption of 78 million Americans over 14 years reporting that, much to the chagrin of the proponents of the conventional wisdom on the subject, the more sodium a person ate, the lower their risk of dying from heart disease. By consuming salt regularly, your cells function properly, utilizing glucose for fuel and shuttling more oxygen through the blood to your vital organs. Blood pressure normalizes and the thyroid gland is able to produce plenty of thyroid hormone T4 to maintain a well-regulated metabolic feedback loop. Most people don't realize this, but sodium actually has a thermogenic effect in the body. And what happens is that when your body temperature increases from the sodium, 
Uh, it actually increases the metabolization of brown fat through the increased activity of the fat synthesizing enzyme. And what that does is it leads to an increase in um, GABA production, which is the brain's main inhibitory neurotransmitter, which has a nice sedative effect and a relaxing effect on the body. So it's great when you're ready to lay down and have a relaxed evening and a good night's sleep to have that extra GABA involved. The increase in the metabolization of the brown fat actually leads to more slow wave sleep, also known as deep sleep. So this slow wave sleep is actually the deepest form of REM sleep when your body, uh, when it's uh, recovery and adaptation mechanisms start kicking in, such as the, the pulsatile release of growth hormone and the consolidation of the learning and memory that happened during the day. And at night, during that slow wave sleep, what your body does is your brain can start pruning the weaker connections that haven't really been uh, reinforced as often. So you actually have this prime time for learning and memory consolidation uh, while you're sleeping, but it only happens in that slow wave deep sleep. And uh, it's also known as synaptic plasticity. So the question becomes, how much salt should you actually eat? Remember, you need to regularly consume enough salt to allow the sodium to regulate the calcium and to prevent excess electrolyte loss in general. The average person will need to consume roughly 60 to 65 milligrams per kilogram body weight of salt daily in order to maintain the proper balance of sodium to calcium, magnesium, and potassium in the cellular milieu. Salt is roughly 40% sodium, so the typical person, depending on their body weight, needs about 10 to 15 grams per day in their diet. If you're consuming baking soda or sodium bicarbonate, you'll need 20 to 22 grams daily since it's roughly 27% sodium. Yes, those recommendations are well above the government RDA guidelines, and that's the whole point. Government guidelines get it wrong. These recommendations are especially important if you're an athlete and or if you exercise regularly, since studies have shown that athletes can lose up to 30 grams of sodium per day, which will clearly impair your physical performance since these levels of sodium loss can wreak havoc on fluid balance and your body's ability to use glucose properly. Dropping below three to five grams of salt intake per day, depending on body weight, has been shown to actually increase water retention due to the decrease in overall blood volume and oxygen delivery. Stop restricting your salt intake. Sodium is necessary for your cells to function at the most basic level. Adequate sodium is really required in order to release that energy and that oxygen so you can start producing more carbon dioxide, which is gonna bring more order to your organs, your cells, your tissues, and ultimately your entire organism. By increasing your daily salt intake, not only are your meals gonna taste more delicious, but you're actively gonna support a healthier thyroid gland, a faster metabolism, higher body temperature, more brown fat burning, normal blood pressure, better sleep, and a healthy libido. Salt is your friend. So throw some extra salt in your favorite dishes, enjoy the delicious taste and the health benefits, and you'll be glad that you started to think again.